Good evening and welcome everyone to the educational webinar on Allergies 101 presented by allergy immunologist Dr. Karina Gobin. I hope you all can hear me well. I'm Dr. Neeta Dhananjaya, MD Chair of the Health Awareness Committee of Indian American Medical Association of Illinois and host for today's webinar. Just to give you a brief overview on the Health Awareness Committee of Indian American Medical Association of Illinois, it works towards bringing awareness and conducting educational programs on various important health issues. And our topic today is allergies. And we are very grateful to the Schaumburg Township Public Library for working with us and for their commitment in bringing various educational webinars to the patrons of the library and to our other audience. And our audience and participants, thank you for being here today. And uh, we hope that you're staying safe and healthy. And we also hope that you have received your flu vaccination and the COVID-19 appropriate booster vaccinations. And I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions and uh, you can ask these questions in the Q&A box or in the chat box. And Dr. Gobin will address as many questions as possible. And uh, it's a reminder that there is also a live transcription option available for you. And also, this is an informational session only. And if you or your dear ones have any health issues, we recommend that you seek medical guidance from your primary care physician. So now a brief introduction on the speaker today, Dr. Karina Gobin. She's an accomplished allergy immunologist. She has completed her undergraduate training at Northwestern University and obtained her MD at Chicago Medical School at Rosalind Franklin University of Medicine and Science. And she's trained in pediatrics followed by her chief residency at Rush Medical Center. And Dr. Gobin has graduated from a fellowship in allergy and immunology at Medical College of Wisconsin. She's trained extensively in both pediatric and adult etiologies of food and environmental allergies, asthma and immunological disorders with world renowned mentors. During her fellowship, she has completed research in asthma medication compliance. And Dr. Gobin is a board certified diplomat of the American Board of Allergy and Immunology. Dr. Gobin, a warm welcome to you and we truly appreciate your time and commitment to provide this educational webinar Despite your busy schedule, I know you had a very busy clinic today. Thank you. Appreciate it. And it's all yours now. Thank you so much. Good evening, uh, everyone. I'm Dr. Gobin. Thank you for having me. Um, you know, today I'm just going to move on to the next slide and we kind of talk about, let's just see. Okay. All right. So I will be talking about allergies today. Okay. Um, I am going to stop between every major topic, and if there are any questions, um, we can kind of address them in those moments. Don't be shy. If there's any questions you have, just let me know. Really, this is meant to kind of just help and uh, kind of teach everyone a little bit about what I do on a daily basis, okay? All right, so let's go on to the next slide. So the breakdown of topics. These are a majority of the patients I see on a regular basis that either we get consulted on in the hospital or come to me in the office more often than not. Um, I will start off with talking mainly about environmental allergies and really nasal congestion. That is kind of a big portion of what we see. Moving on, we'll talk about food allergies. Then we'll talk about drug allergies, stinging insects and what the symptoms and allergies they may cause. We'll also speak a little bit about immunodeficiency and then uh, move on to a little bit about allergies and COVID and how it can be very confusing to differentiate. All right, so environmental allergies. If you can imagine, this is a big chunk of what I do. And so uh, kind of looking at a little environmental allergies, People usually uh, you know, know of this as hay fever or they know of it as seasonal allergies. And you think of spring and fall, the time when people have symptoms of itchy eyes and runny nose. And you know, many reasons can cause what's called a stuffy nose, okay? So when we think of stuffy nose, it's actually known as rhinitis. And um, if you think of other words like sinusitis or arthritis, that itis portion means inflammation. And so rhino actually means nose. And so when we think of the word rhinitis, we're thinking inflammation of the nose. 
And so when we think about it from that aspect, you know, there are many other causes in addition to allergies that can cause issues for people that could include infection, different medications can do it, pregnancy, the weather outside, if something is stuck up there, even perfume or smoke. And so um, the version that is caused by allergies is known as allergic rhinitis. And so if you think about the prevalence of allergic rhinitis, it's affecting about 20 to 40 million individuals in the United States. It's about 30% of adults and up to 40% of children. The prevalence remains constant in young adults, but it gradually declines in later years. And when we're thinking about little kiddos, uh, allergic rhinitis is more common in young boys than in young girls. But by adolescence, there's really no difference between the sexes and prevalence. And there's actually no impact by race or socioeconomic status on the prevalence of allergic rhinitis. If you look at this graph, you can see that there is a genetic predisposition. The first pie chart shows no family history. So you can have this de novo or meaning like no one else has it in the family but about 17.2% of people. If you have one parent with allergic rhinitis, you're in, you've increased to about a quarter of a chance of having it. Two parents brings it up above 50%. So clearly if your parents have it, there is a good chance that you could have it. And so we do ask that question um, when people come into the office. Now questions I ask, okay, this is kind of, when we think about environmental allergies or congestion or the reason why people are coming in for allergies per se, environmental allergies are often pushed to the wayside. You know, people usually come in when they're not feeling good at all, but to the point where they're almost miserable. When we think about that, I think it's because rarely can these issues be fatal or cause severe issues in people's minds. And actually people get very used to not being able to breathe. And so we go into detail about what's happening. So first we talk about pattern of symptoms. Do these occur in seasons or do they occur year round? You know, some people will say that I feel like I notice it most in August or I notice it most in July in the summer or right, you know, when April hits, I feel like I'm having issues. That helps me understand if there's a seasonal component like a pollen potentially or year round. Year round could be that you have multiple allergies playing a role or that you have something that's indoor that causes more issue for you on a more chronic basis. Duration of symptoms, you know, do we feel like there is a chronicity or if are they chronic or do they come and go? From that aspect, um, you know, there are some people who will describe that I always feel bad. I always feel like no matter what I do, I have some level of congestion, but then on top of it, it's way worse for me in the spring and fall. And so we kind of can figure out that maybe there is a perennial aspect there, but maybe in addition to that, on top of it, they have some seasonal issues as well. And then when we talk about severity of symptoms, the biggest question that kind of comes up often that I try to ask is what's the effect on your quality of life, right? People can describe allergies as no big deal, just a little bit of itching and sneezing, I need to pop a Claritin, I'm fine, all the way to incapacitating. And so when we're looking for remedies with eyes or nose issues, that's fine. But if someone's having breathing problems or headaches, this can cause a lot of strife on a daily basis. And that helps me determine kind of how far am I gonna go with treatment and what am I gonna recommend? All right, so signs and symptoms of allergies specifically. Symptoms, our biggest symptom that plays a role in allergies is actually itch, okay? The itch is really something that I look for and if we're not noticing that, then you know sometimes I have to perk up my ears and try to figure out if something else potentially is going on. We often see sneezing, runny nose. We can have people complain of headache because of sinus pressure, congestion. And then when we think about our eyes, um, itchy or red eyes. And when we're looking at allergies versus pink eye, you know there are a lot of other things that can cause very similar symptoms. But if I'm thinking allergies, I'm thinking both eyes are affected at the same level. Now signs, this is kind of what I see on exam or things that I see and make me think that allergies could be playing a role. So allergic shiners are actually just a pooling of liquid or what we would call congestion underneath the eye. It gives it a kind of pink or purple hue and a little bit swollen. We see that uh, when patients have like nose blockages and kind of leading congestion back in that area. The allergic crease is actually this picture do you see with uh, the blue little arrows that's showing actually when people wipe their nose. This is called the allergic salute actually. And we see it often. And then actually doing that repetitively will create a crease on your nose. 
And so people come into the office and I'll notice that and I'll ask them, do you do this? And they're surprised that I know, but actually it's a very common sign that we see that you are rubbing your nose because it's dripping. Denny's lines are this bottom picture listed here. That is a line that we see underneath the lower eyelid crease. The etiology or the you know, pathology behind it is a little bit unknown, but we do see it often in allergic rhinitis and also eczema. And so that's another sign for me to kind of think of like, okay, something allergic is happening here. When we move on to a little bit more focused on the exam, um, I can see fluid in the eardrums at times when there's pressure because the nasal passages are so congested. When I look in people's noses, um, we call it swollen nasal mucosa, but there are turbinates and different structures in there that look really full. They look inflamed. Um, they look very like full of mucus. And then finally, like I described, red eyes can be seen. We can also see mucus. There are also a lot of other specific findings that we can see, but um, that is pretty much as far as detail, I would say the red eyes and itching are two big ones that we would be concerned about. All right, now these are the specific allergens that someone would test, an allergist would test when you're coming in, okay? Now there are a lot of things that can cause congestion, but when we think about aero allergens, things that are floating in the air that lead to congestion, I've listed them out here. So majority of allergists will be testing kind of a smattering of these to kind of determine what you potentially are allergic to. So if you look at your pollen, you know, sometimes people say I'm allergic to pollen, but that's pretty broad. And I'll go in a little bit more detail about time frame in, in a future slide, but trees occur initially, and then grass will come thereafter. Weeds come there after that. And in the Midwest, uh, ragweed is a very big allergen that occurs in the August time frame. Now, mold is an indoor and outdoor allergen. It's a type of fungus that spores and it floats the air and there can really grow on anything. It's often presented on plant material in the soil. You might see it in rotting logs, in plant material, fallen leaves, compost piles. These are really ideal places for mold to grow. Really, if it's very, very humid, you can expect mold to be there. And, you know, we're kind of entering into fall now, right? It's been fall for about a week. And this crisp fall air it means like shorter days, nice spooky decorations, football. And one would think with the typically cool weather that there are less allergens in the air. And that is true from a pollen standpoint, but it's, to, it's really important to remember that mold spores are still present until the first frost. And that increased exposure kind of, you people might let their guard down a little bit and it can lead to more allergy and asthma symptoms. Then after that, we talk about dust mites. Now dust mites are microscopic bugs. We cannot see them without a microscope, but they are everywhere. They feed off our dead skin cells. So if we are there, they are there. It has nothing to do with how clean you are or how much you kind of like swipe everything down or clean up or vacuum, they will be there. And if you are allergic, you may have symptoms. All right. So this gets into a little bit of how we find out what you're allergic to, okay? We have two modalities, two ways we test for environmental allergies. And so skin pick testing is what people think of when you think of allergy testing. When anyone mentions that they did it, this type of testing is not a, it previously was a, an actual scratch. Now we, it's a little bit more of a poke, I would say. And we have different ways to do it. This top figure shows, uh, about eight being done at the same time. So there are different ways to do it. A lot of times there's also just one little one you can use. So it could be single testing, if we're thinking maybe of food, which I'll talk about later, or multiple at once, uh, which we do for younger kids to make sure that the testing application occurs faster rather than slower. So it's not a shot, but a little poke. And depending on how many things we're testing, that's how many pokes you get. So for example, for environmental allergens, between the ones that I listed in the last slide, um, at our office, we test about 30. So that's a different, a few different types of trees, grasses, and then ragweed is just one type of allergen. There are different weeds, different molds that are indoor and outdoor. There are two types of dust mite. And we also check cat and dog and then cockroach, okay? So in addition to the allergens, we also check controls. Controls are ways to help us understand that the test is working appropriately. We have a negative control, which is just salt water. And that is a poke as well. Same thing, you wouldn't know the difference when you get the test placed, 
but it's to make sure that just touching your skin doesn't cause a reaction. As you can imagine, if you have sensitive skin or you have um, what's called hives, you could have a reaction just from someone touching you. So that's to help us understand that it's actually due to the allergen and not just from being touched. The second one is a positive control. That's similar to that second line on a COVID test that we're also familiar with over these past few years. That's to make sure the test works appropriately. Now, there are different reasons why a test wouldn't work. And the main reason in general for us is because someone is on antihistamines. So histamine is our positive control. And if you can imagine, an antihistamine blocks that. So you have to be off of antihistamines uh, you know, for a different varying amount of times. People will have a different offices, but usually between three to five days in order to do this testing. Now, blood work is also an option. Um, and for that, you don't have to be off of antihistamines. So I reserve this for patients who cannot complete the skin testing, and there are various reasons for that. Uh, when we talk about the main reasons why I wouldn't do it is um, if someone has really bad asthma, if they're coming in for respiratory issues, and I feel like I can't appropriately put skin testing on without the concern of a potential you know, exacerbation of their symptoms or if they cannot get off antihistamines for whatever reason. Antihistamines can be used for other um, allergic conditions as well. And so we might wanna keep them on for those patients. There are also other medicines from a mental health standpoint or hypertension standpoint that just can't be taken off and are more important. So in those settings, I will also consider blood work. Um, and another thing that we might not think of is that I, I can't do skin testing. So if someone has tattoos all over their back and arms, then you know blood work is our only option as well. The second round of testing is called intradermal testing. This is one that maybe people aren't as familiar with or you don't think about as much, but it is very, very sensitive. And once I do both of these rounds of testing, I can use this information to make allergy shots for people. So intradermal testing is not a shot. So I try to start off with that to let people know, and it is a needle that we use. And it's a needle we use in the arm just underneath the first layer of skin. And that concentration, um, we use the same different allergens that we use the first round, but it's a double check. So if something was negative the first round, I will check again with an intradermal test. So that number of how many we can do will range from none if everything's positive from the first round, or um, if we have none that show up on the first round, it'll be all of them. So for our office, it's about 10, okay? And uh, with those two rounds, it's, you know, each round takes about 20 to 30 minutes, depending on the office that you go see. And we use that information to kind of determine uh, what you're allergic to. Okay. Just a little bit more about testing. When we test, um, you will see a little hive in areas that you are um, allergic to. So the histamine will for sure feel itchy and will for sure have a little bit of a hive if you have stopped the medicines you're supposed to stop. And we measure with what's called a caliper. It looks like a little ruler. So we'll actually measure the size of those allergies, so what the reaction was. Next, we move on to how to treat. Okay. So avoidance measures are things we can do from a non-medicine standpoint. And I'm going to go into a little bit more detail specifically about each allergen in our next slides. But um, if you think about how prevalent allergies are, all these medicines or almost all of our medicines are available over the counter. So you have access to these today if you need it. And so I'm going to go through the list of the majority of the ones we use and kind of talk about them individually. So antihistamines provide immediate and temporary relief. So if you think about it, they work right away, but also they wear off right away. They do not change how your body is responding to allergens. And so it's really just blocking histamine, you know? So it's just trying to take the thing that your allergy cell makes and try to block it. So there are many out there. I'm sure you've heard of a smattering of them, including Claritin, Zyrtec, Allegra, uh, Zizol, Hydroxazine, and then there are also nasal spray versions too. So we break down the different types of these Benadryl is one uh, that is most commonly known. Everyone knows about Benadryl. Everyone will try to use Benadryl. Now, I don't love Benadryl. <laughs> it lasts for a few hours. So it's about four to six hours. So realistically, if you want to have, you know, some level of relief every single hour of the day, you need to take it four to six times a day. If you think about that and how you have felt in the past when you use Benadryl, think about it. It crosses the blood-brain barrier, meaning that it is a medication that leads to feeling tired, feeling sedated. 
And so there's just no way people can take it for its antihistamine effects without feeling super tired. And then there's a small group of people can have a paradoxical reaction that actually has a stimulant reaction. Those, those, you know, a lot of times the parents will say, my kid was off the wall when they were using Benadryl. So usually the side effects of Benadryl are those that we just don't want. Once in a while, people will say, I just take Benadryl to kind of go to sleep and it helps me in that aspect. Yes, I will say that it's okay to use, but it's not a great um, everyday therapy to kind of help control allergies if you're allergic to like, let's say trees or grass and you're trying to also, you know, work or go to school. Now, then we look at Claritin, Allegra, Zizol, and then um, talk about the difference between these. So Zyrtec and Zizol are actually, um, they're called enantiomers. So they are cousins. If Zyrtec looked in the mirror, it would see Zizol. So it actually has very similar effect and similar um, kind of properties. Both of them work for 24 hours and do a great job. Zizol is the most recent on the market, so sometimes a little bit more expensive. Um, and then after that, uh, Allegra is also another one that I like. Allegra is the least sedating, meaning the one that works the same level as Zyrtec and Zizol, uh, but it makes people less tired than those two. Both Zyrtec and Zizol don't make many people tired, but about five to 10% of people can feel some level of sedation. Then Claritin is also an antihistamine that's often used. It's known as Loratadine as its generic name. This one is also one that if you're using it and it works for you, I leave it on, but it's a little bit weaker of an antihistamine in comparison to the Zyrtec, Allegra, and Zizol. Moving on to intranasal corticosteroids. That is what you think of when you hear um, nasocort or you hear uh, Flonase or Rhinocort. This is your best defense for long-term improvement. It's a great long-term medication against allergens. It can start working right away, but it can take about two to three weeks to really take effect. Um, it's a great medicine if used appropriately. It just has to be used every single day and it has to be used um, on our, you can't like miss a day here and there. Uh, and then usually we tell people that it has to be used appropriately. We can kind of go into how to use that if anyone is interested. Next, we move on to leukotriene inhibitors. This is something that is prescription only. And if you have heard of it or have allergies, these medic medications include Singular. Its generic name is Montelukast. So when we think about histamine, it's a molecule that causes a lot of the allergy symptoms one may experience, but it's not the only one. So antihistamines block that, intranasal steroids also do help from that aspect. But leukotriene inhibitors block another mediator and it's used often for allergies and asthma. So I like it as a medication, as a starting point for breathing issues, if we're noticing our allergies are causing any breathing issues, but also it's a great adjunct medicine if I feel like nasal sprays and antihistamines just aren't cutting it. The last one is immunotherapy. Just gonna move on here. So immunotherapy is known as allergy shots, allergen immunotherapy. And this is our closest thing we have to a cure, okay? It is a preventative treatment for allergic reactions and it can be used for everything that we described already, but also, uh, which I'll talk about later, like venom immunotherapy against bees or wasps. So what immunotherapy is, is that it's a gradual increase in the actual thing you're allergic to. So if you think about it, it's the closest thing to a cure, but also the purest thing I can offer someone from a medication standpoint, because there's no medicine in it. So we basically increase slowly, and that helps your immune system learn how to tolerate these different allergens. And it basically leads to reduction of symptoms at a certain time and when you encounter them in the future. It's a great, great, great therapy we have available. Um, but from that standpoint, you know, if you think about what it is, you have to get shots on a regular basis. So there's a buildup phase initially where you come in on a weekly basis for more places, some, for most places, maybe there is some, you know, you could come maybe twice a week uh, on some vials. And then you move into a maintenance phase, which is usually monthly, okay? But when we talk about, um, the commitment aspect, like I said, it is definitely a commitment. Okay. Uh, you know, you have to come in every single week and it and build up on dosing, but really it can really help a lot of people just like how working out or eating healthy is. It doesn't, it doesn't work right away. Um, people can notice an improvement. Uh, probably I would say like within the first four to five months of starting allergy shots, but uh, the best thing about it is that 80 to 85% of people will feel some relief. 
So that's our main goal, right? We want people to feel better. And so from that standpoint, um, that's our number one goal or endpoint. And then thereafter, we'll be to try to get you off other medicines. So majority of our patients who start allergy shots can also stop taking their medicines that they've been taking on a daily basis. And we, we work together. We work together to see kind of when we can do that and ultimately what we can take off. Uh, my goal is always to kind of help, you know, with those more severe issues like respiratory issues. So if I feel like a patient has respiratory issues, um, I may be more persistent in recommending allergy shots for them. Or if I feel like we've kind of tried everything we can from a at-home standpoint, you know, then this is where I recommend that. Many people also come in kind of just asking what's the best thing that I can offer. And so there are some patients that also just go on immunotherapy you know, was in the first few visits because they have tried everything or they've had allergies for a really long time. And the nice thing about allergy shots really is that people will come in and say, I wish I did this sooner. I wish I just committed to this earlier because I feel so much better. And it's like the greatest thing to hear is, uh, you know, a, a provider that there's something that we've done and it's helping you feel better. All right, so now I'm gonna go into the avoidance measures. This is a little bit more about um, how we can avoid as much as we can when it comes to allergies. Uh, you know, when we're talking about trees, this is our first allergen that comes out in the year. You, know, you think you have a nice little reprieve uh, in the February timeframe and then tree pollen starts sneaking back out around April and hits us pretty hard in, uh, I'm sorry, hit, yeah comes out in March and hits us pretty hard in April until about May, okay? Thereafter, grass will start. Grass is from mid-May until the end of June. Weeds will start around the same time, but they end at the end of summer. So they were still out probably until pretty recently in, in August timeframe. Now, ragweed begins very promptly in August. This year it began August 1st, um, but you will notice kind of those first two weeks of August, that's where ragweed comes out and it stays around till the end of September. Now, different ways we can help with our allergens from the outside. We tell people to keep their windows closed in the bedroom when they're driving, um, trying not to hang out clothes to dry because pollen can cling to it and then have a lasting effect for you. Um, pollen counts are highest when we're outside in the morning, so from 5 a.m. to 10 a.m. So our office counts the pollen for Illinois. Uh, we keep a track on it uh, via our social media accounts through the National Allergy Bureau. If anyone posts on, um, you know, like Tom Skilling, all these people, that the allergy levels kind of help us understand what's going on outside. So if it's a day where there's a lot of allergen to the thing that you're allergic to, you might think like, okay, maybe I'll stay home till 11. You're gonna be outside for a long time, okay? You know, you've been outside all day, it's grass season. Think about when you come back in, changing out of those clothes, taking a shower, washing your hair. This is just to limit the amount of pollen exposure you've had. For grass pollen specifically, if you're cutting the grass, um, thinking about wearing goggles or wearing a mask at that time. Another thing is that like we talked about, allergies can be affected, can affect your eyes and so, you know, if you wear contact lenses, you can think about changing those out a little bit more frequently to make sure that um, you just are preventing the accumulation of pollen on that lens. And then, um, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about the other ones next. So these are our indoor allergen avoidance measures. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about dust mite and then mold actually is indoor and outdoor. So we'll kind of go through that as well. Now, dust mite, like I said, is a microscopic organism. It lives in cozy places. It lives in your pillows, your mattress, your carpet, your upholstered furniture. And it's gross, but it eats our dead skin cells and hair. And then we're allergic to their waste and their bodies actually. So, you know, if, like I said before, they're there because we're there. So from that standpoint, there's not a lot you can do, but we like to mitigate little by little. And so one thing that's a great recommendation that we always usually tell our dust mite allergic patients is that buy dust mite encasement covers. You can encase your pillows, your mattress, and your box spring. Think about it from a standpoint of like, you can't wash those. You can't wash your actual pillow. And so getting something to encase it is a great way to help reduce how long those mites are holding on for. If you have more than one pillow on the bed, all of them should be encased, okay? Washing your bedding in hot water every one to two weeks. 
They like to hang on cozy places, like I said already. So throw pillows, stuff, toys, taking that away from the bed um, is really important. You can keep one on if you want to and rotate potentially. Getting a HEPA filter, okay? A HEPA filter stands for high efficiency purified air. Since the kind of, you know, beginning of COVID, there are many on the market that kind of take out viruses and bacteria, all these other things, but a pretty good HEPA filter kind of costs in the like six to $80 range um, and can be a really great way to clean up the air that you're sleeping in. So I usually recommend that patients keep it at the head of their bed, kind of when, where they're sleeping to kind of clean out that air. And the last thing is humidity. They thrive in a humid environment. And so if you think about just more moisture in the air, easier to hold on to things. And so uh, keeping the humidity less than 40% in the house is actually very beneficial for dust mite patients. Uh, there are different ways to kind of measure this. Some uh, furnaces have humidifiers, so then kind of looking into that. Also, there are humidity sensors you can buy. They're small. You can kind of keep an eye on your humidity level. And so this is another way to kind of, you know, understand how much humidity is in your home. Also, if you think about it, you know, we have to think about the dry winters uh, in Chicago, but humidifiers might not be the best way to kind of help you. You're feeling like, oh, I'm stuffed. You get the humidifier, then you learn that you're allergic to dust mites. So it can be kind of a vicious cycle. All right, the next is mold. So mold, like I said, is indoor and outdoor. From an outdoor standpoint, it is the highest in the midsummer until the frost and then can occur year round indoors. So uh, indoor molds, because I already talked a little bit about outdoor molds, they grow in areas of high humidity. So you can think of like, you know, your basement or poorly ventilated bathrooms. Prevention wise, you can keep your windows closed in your bedroom and when you're driving. So similar to kind of what you're thinking about pollen. Um, and then when we're talking about indoor allergens, you can try to use diluted bleach to eliminate visible mold on showers and shower curtains. Try not to sleep at basement level bedrooms if you are allergic to mold. Removing carpet from the basement if flooding has occurred. Same thing from a standpoint of dust mite, keeping the humidity um, kind of under the 40 to 50% range. Now, the big thing with mold, you know, is that sometimes we think it's the other, something else that's causing our issue, but uh, firewood in a home and then a live Christmas tree are two really big ways that mold can get inside our house. Pine itself is not that al allergenic and it's actually there are mold spores that are coming inside with the tree that cause a lot of increase in respiratory symptoms and potentially allergy symptoms as well. So mold season uh, usually ends the first frost. This is about three to four days where the morning temperatures are below freezing. So it's a little hard to predict exactly when in Chicago that occurs. You know, I would say kind of at the end of sometimes in October we have snow, but then sometimes in December we can have like a 60 degree day. So kind of in this range, it can go up and down until probably the beginning of the year. We think about pets, okay? So when we talk about prevention for pets, uh, keeping your pets out of the room you sleep in at all times is very important. That's the area you sleep, that's your safe space. So from that standpoint, trying really hard to keep that clean for yourself. Getting a standalone HEPA filter again for the same reasons, kind of how we described for dust mite. Now for our patients who are allergic to animals that don't see them regularly, uh, you know, we talk about washing your hands after touching animals is really important. Um, if you are going to see a pet, I usually talk about pre-prevention, taking medications prior to seeing them, trying to be, trying to limit exposure when you're with them. And then when you come home, again, like we talked about being with, you know, pollens outdoors, taking those clothes off, going for a shower, and then potentially redosing with um, allergy medicines again. And a lot of people will say, you know, I've had a high, high, hypoallergenic pet, it's okay. Unfortunately, there's no such thing as a hypoallergenic pet. We really um, kind of come into thinking about looking at patients who have this allergy and it happens to any type of pet. So um, dogs in general, you can have different levels of um, allergenicity to different breeds. So you could be fine with one and then not another. In general with cats, if you're allergic to cats, you are allergic to all cats. So from that standpoint, um, you know, we try to say if you're allergic to cats to kind of keep them away. And the bigger thing is that uh, pet allergies in general have a really small size. Like, so when we talk about micron size, they're pretty small and specifically cat. Um, so they're really potent allergens as well. All right. So we can think of allergies as being harmless, um, you know, because 
really past the effects we feel, you don't really think nothing anything is, is gonna happen, right? But there are a lot of issues that can occur if we don't treat this. So on a very you know, superficial basis, I'm sure you can think of infections can lead to needing antibiotics regularly, recurrent use of antibiotics. Um, if we mouth breathe, it can lead to a high arched palate, so changing your anatomy. Breathing control can lead to worsening asthma exacerbations, and for some people, honestly, potential hospitalizations. If you think about it from like a whole like, you know, global picture, if you have headaches, you have difficulty concentrating, you have fatigue, that can lead to harder time at school and work. And so it all leads back to this kind of thing that I've talked about over and over again is decreased quality of life and trying to improve that if we can. All right. So not all rhinitis, like I said previously, is due to allergies, right? We have many people who come in thinking they're allergic to everything because they always feel bad. And then we learn on testing that there's nothing there. So what other things can cause rhinitis? Weather can do it. So different changes in temperature. I'm sure many of us have experienced you go outside when it's super cold and your nose starts running. Um, and exercise can do it. And eating sometimes different types of foods. Spicy foods can do it. That falls under a category called vasomotor rhinitis. Without getting into like too much detail, it has to do with these compounds leading to your blood vessels and your nose getting smaller and bigger, which is called dilating and constricting. Okay. Then alcohol um, itself is a histamine mediator, meaning that it destabilizes the, the cell that contains histamine, so it can lead to congestion. And then perfume, smoke, these can cause what's called irritant rhinitis. So as you can imagine, fragrance, perfume, smoke, they can lead to congestion. You know, that has to do with the actual molecule of those things. And then Afrin, I hate Afrin, but Afrin is a medication that does have a little bit of a, you know, like kind of room in our, in my field, but uh, it can cause what's called specifically rhinitis medicamentosa. Okay. So when my patients are very, um, you know, they're at, they have like, they feel really horrible and they're like, I'm going to try anything. A lot of times people will reach for Afrin and Afrin is a great medicine and kind of opening up your airways as a decongestant. But if it's used for more than three days, more than three times, 72 hours, it can lead to rebound congestion, meaning that when you stop it, your congestion will be worse than it was when you, before you took it. So from that standpoint, there is a withdrawal and an addiction that tends to occur. And so we have patients who start taking it and they just cannot get off of it. Taking off of it can be very, um, actually very hard to do where it involves oral steroids and kind of training your nose again, but uh, a medication itself can be the reason why someone has congestion. And the last thing I talked about is infection. You know, if you have a sinusitis or recurrent sinusitis, which could be either from not, you know, allergies being treated well, which can be one way, but if you have anatomical issues, we usually work really well and in close with our um, ENT friends. And um, they do a good job of ultimately helping us understand if something is going on from that standpoint, maybe surgery, maybe there could be polyps, et cetera. Okay, this is the end of information for environmental allergies. Um, do we wanna go through questions potentially? Yes, sounds good. Um, let's see here. We have, uh, it's actually, it's in the Q&A uh, box. Let, let's go through one by one. Um, so it says, what about long-term side effects and do they stop getting less effective? Um, I think probably they're talking about the medications. Yeah, um, in general, the side effects related to the medications like antihistamines and intranasal steroids are pretty minimal. They're actually very benign medications. We have patients that are on it for like 50 plus years, okay? When I think about the uh, side effects when it comes to antihistamines, I talked about it a little bit. Sedation is probably the number one side effect we see and then dryness, so people can feel a little hoarse when they use it. Um, some antihistamines on a regular basis, um, you know, information I also learned as time went on is that can lead to like a, a little bit harder to lose weight. Uh, so that, you know, some other antihistamines like ciproheptadine are used actually as appetite stimulants. So not so much the ones that we use regularly, but there is potentially a little bit of that that can occur. For intranasal steroids, it is a steroid. So um, something that we really work on is how people use the medicine, because if we spray constantly at the middle of our nose, there are a lot of little capillaries, a little blood vessels that can break, you know, and so that leads to potential nosebleeds. So we talk about essentially how to use the medication, where to spray it. And if we're having repetitive nosebleeds or issues 
there are um, essentially different nose sprays we can try to. Yeah. So is there any one particular which has less side effects, uh, side effects like Allegra versus Zyrtec versus Zyzer? Um, I would say if we're going for the least amount of side effects from the standpoint of feeling dry and feeling tired, Allegra is probably the one I would say, but it's a little bit more expensive. So yeah. cost versus, you know. Yeah. Yeah. The next question is, would the allergy shots work for allergies for of cats and dogs? And how long approximately would this take? So everyone's a little, every office is a little different from a standpoint of, you know, what the buildup and maintenance is, but yes, number one for cats and dogs, it can work. So um, I, I very much so recommend it because those are two allergens that can lead to respiratory issues. Uh, and then thereafter, um, at our office, the uh, buildup phase is about, depending on how often you come in the beginning, because you can come twice a week for the less concentrated vials around six to eight months. And then you move on to the maintenance dosing, which is once a month. So if you think about it in comparison to taking something every day, trying to lessen the blow here, it's about three to five years, like college, you know, allergy college, and then you graduate and then you're done. You are technically done at that point. Okay. So during that time, like, so they have to be totally away from these um, cats and dogs or like no. they can be interacting with them? No, they can interact with them. You know, obviously when we talk about exposure, that can still lead to symptoms, but as far as being near them, there's no restriction. You know, um, we may have actually a better understanding of like how you're doing with that allergen if you are constantly exposed to them, uh, but ultimately you don't have to be away from them at that time. Yeah, good, good. And then I think the next one is kind of like a philosophical. They're asking, are we getting weaker as a human race? Like back in the day, <laughs> I don't remember uh, allergies being such a concern for people. Nowadays, yeah. you can't even uh, you know, bring peanut butter jelly sandwich to school. <laughs> you know, this is a question that comes up all the time. Um, and without getting too far in the philosophy of it, it's still pretty unknown why. Um, why we have this so much more. And it's a very big um, issue in more modernized countries versus um, developing countries. So, you know, oftentimes actually like my family or my, you know, parents or grandparents will say like, this is not an issue from the country I grew, you know, where we came from. And it's actually still not an issue there. It's not something like we don't see EpiPens and AbiQs in India too often, right? So, um, there are multiple thoughts uh, out there. There's something called the hygiene hypothesis that has to do with the fact that we in society are quote unquote cleaner. Now, when we talk about cleaner, I don't mean like cleaner roads. I mean, from everything, you know, talking about antibiotic use from the time that you were born, right? If your mom has an infection when you're pregnant, she can get antibiotics all the way. Um, you know, like you get your first ear infection, all that kind of stuff. Uh, all the food we eat, it's pasteurized. Everything is clean before it even reaches our house. So we are experiencing less and less foreign, but you know, kind of scary things from day one. So then from that standpoint, everything could be a little bit scary, right? So our body is, you know, we're talking about food allergies next, actually. Um, everything seems scary then, you know, for our body. And so that's one aspect. The other thing is that um, I'll talk a little bit more about with food allergies, but what the immunoglobulin we are checking with these allergies is called IgE. And so IgE is in our world, in America, very much so related to allergies, but prior, or if we're trying to figure out why someone has so much IgE and they have no allergies is also parasites. So parasites are just not something we deal with anymore here. And it used to be the protection or is the protection against um, parasites in other countries. So, you know, those are the two working theories, I would say mainly, but I don't really know. And I don't think we know exactly yet, right? You know, which one is, or if it's both, or if there's something else going on. Okay. So yeah. that's the answer. And the next question is, if nasal sprays make me sneeze, does that mean my body is rejecting it, not responding to it? I think that requires probably a little bit more information. Um, you know, usually nasal sprays is adding liquid to your nose. So from that standpoint, it could be just tickling you a little bit and uh, use of it on a regular basis might lead to improvement in that sensation. I think I'd have to know like how long someone was using it or um, how many times they've tried or potentially um, which ones they've used. Because also in addition to the actual medicine, which is the steroid, every nasal spray comes in a primer. 
So it could be an alcoholic primer, a water primer, and we would go into detail a little bit more about maybe if you've tried one, would we try another one? Um, maybe the, you know, um, they can probably, you know, elaborate that in the next question. And um, uh, other follow-up question is like, why and how does exercise cause rhinitis? Uh, so I talked about a little bit, uh, basically your uh, blood vessels, they can dilate, which means open up more, or they can constrict, which means they close up more. And in that process, you have uh, leaky kind of like vessels. And so you can lead to essentially, you know, runny noses from that standpoint. Most people probably feel more runny noses than they feel congestion when they exercise. And so it has to do with just kind of getting your body moving. Um, it's actually the same reason why uh, spicy foods can do it. And um, what else did I say? Yeah, those are the two, right, that I said previously. Yeah. And um, there is a question about food, uh, but then I think you'll be addressing in the next That's slide. So yeah. we'll skip to the next question then. <clears throat> are there any long term consequences of untreated allergies? Yeah, we kind of talked about it a little bit, right? Um, I think the biggest thing to think about is. If you're having repetitive infections, you're using antibiotics over and over again. That leads to potential, um, you know, you become ultimately immune to certain antibiotics. Uh, you can have side effects from certain antibiotics, like we talked about with like the hygiene hypothesis. Using antibiotics over and over again are not good for you. Like we're trying really hard to get away from that if we can, entering the root cause. Um, if you constantly have headaches, right? If you have pressure what's that leading to on a daily basis? Are you able to take care of your family, do your work, you know, kind of from that standpoint, that's another aspect of things. Um, mouth breathing can lead to a higher arch palate that can lead to like kind of how we breathe at night. And the biggest one I think for me that I feel like if someone has this, then I really try to push kind of, you know, immunotherapy potentially is the breathing control. Uh, if you don't take care of your allergies, if you think about your nose, your ears, your throat, it's all connected and leads down to your lungs, right? So all that drainage, all that inflammation, all that mucus can go down your lungs and potentially lead to inflammation down there. And that's something that I don't like to mess with, right? You have to go to the hospital, you need to use treatment there, potentially get intubated. I mean, I'm being obviously very dramatic right now when I'm describing it, but we do have many patients that, you know, come as consults where they you know, saw an animal, and then that led to an asthma exacerbation from there on out. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, this is about medication, the side effects of Zyrtec and Famotidine on long-term basis. Yeah, um, so uh, Zyrtec is a little different than Famotidine in that uh, Famotidine does work, but oftentimes it's not used in my field more uh, from a reflux standpoint. You know, there will be talks about, I think more so when we're thinking about reflux medications, there are proton pump inhibitors that are omeprazole, lansoprazole, that there's a lot of uh, concern about um, osteoporosis and osteopenia. So um, I would say from that standpoint, I see it more so being an issue with those medicines and they can get very confusing as to which one is causing the issue. But really, like I said, with Zyrtec, a lot of times it's mainly the sedation and dryness that we see. Uh, Dr. Gobinda, we, we have many questions, but I think <laughs> we can uh, uh, move going? to the next slide and then okay. at the end we can address. All yeah. right. Okay. So our next thing we're going to talk about is uh, food allergies. So uh, food allergy is a term that's thrown around, uh, you know, very loosely, I would say, but we really do have to break down what's going on. <clears throat> There's a huge continuum. But when we're trying to define an allergy, uh, you know, from my standpoint, my biggest concern, or at least what I'm trying to figure out, and I think most of us are trying to figure out, is what we talk about an IgE mediated re response. And so, Ig is that word I just described previously, immunoglobulin E. That's what we measure for our different allergens like the pollen and ragweed and pet and dog and all that kind of stuff, but also with food. And so an IgE mediated food reaction is an immediate response uh, from your immune system and it releases all these cells in your body kind of instantaneously. It can be caused by food, but also other medications can do it and stinging insects can do it. And these are those really scary symptoms that we talk about, hives, swelling, difficulty breathing, throwing up, diarrhea, loss of consciousness. And some people will describe the sense of impending doom, okay? So that is what a lot of times when you come to an allergist, that's what we're testing for, okay? 
And then there are many conditions that are caused by food. And we see many people in addition to just IgE mediated reactions, but our testing is really meant specifically for that. Okay. Other conditions that we talk about or we see often and we share with, you know, potentially GI doctors include eosinophilic esophagitis. That has to do more with like if people feel like when they eat food, it's getting stuck or actual food is getting stuck. Um, and it has to do with having eosinophils, which is an allergy cell in your esophagus in a place that normally doesn't have any allergy cells. F pies is another form of allergy we see more often in the younger population. It stands for food protein intolerance enterocolitis syndrome. So obviously that's a lot of butters and words. And so F pies is easier. It has to do with a reaction that occurs not after you eat it immediately, but several hours later. And those patients, um, how they present is repetitive vomiting. And they're throwing up so much that you can think of from a standpoint of it's not so much that the food that was the issue, obviously it's what caused the problem, but the fact that they're losing so much liquid and can lead to severe dehydration to the point where people need to be hospitalized. The last thing is called oral allergy syndrome, okay? Oral allergy syndrome is actually related more so back to pollen. And so um, I don't know if anyone in the audience has this, but you may notice if you eat, let's say an apple or a peach, a stone pitted fruit, some people feel it with avocado, um, you eat it and your mouth feels itchy. Uh, you can feel it, maybe your lip feels a little swollen. So it's not like as you're like, huh, this is not as severe as what I would think of maybe with eating peanut per se, but I'm noticing that I'm having this now. About a small percent can also feel when they have digested the food or it's in their stomach, stomach pain. And so another thing is that they, can, they can't eat it in the raw form, but they can eat it in the cooked form without any issue because the protein in it that you're allergic to denatures. So if you think about it, apples grow on trees, right? And so actually those patients are very often, it's not so much the apple that they're allergic to, but actually the tree pollen, right? And so when people come in kind of describing fruits and vegetables causing issues, I immediately start thinking about oral allergy syndrome. And it's really hard if you're trying to be healthy and you can't eat any fruits or vegetables, or there are a lot of fruits and vegetables that cause issues for you. Um, we kind of talk about how we can deal with that and take care of that. Now, food allergies, um, you know, a really big topic nowadays. The most common foods that cause issue I have listed here, uh, there's a top nine. And so that includes sesame, peanuts, tree nuts, shellfish, fish, eggs, milk, so cow's milk, soy, and then wheat. And um, last year, sesame was designated as a top nine allergen. So it's a newer one. And so when we talk about that, that means that it has to be listed as an ingredient that could be in the food you're consuming. So this starts January 1st of next year. So that means right now, it does not have to be specifically listed and can fall under natural flavor or spice. So for our sesame allergic patients, we really have to look and see um, kind of from trends, essentially like what foods potentially contain sesame. So big foods that contain sesame include, um, you know, Mediterranean diet, a lot of tahini is like just ground up sesame. Um, hummus has sesame in it from the tahini as well, but also found in a lot of, you know, Asian foods as well. And then um, when we talk about food allergies kind of in a broader sense, you know, uh, the ones that we at this time have data to show is that not sesame and seafood are allergies that people tend not to grow out of. So meaning that if you have one of these allergies, about 80% of people will not grow out of that allergy. Whereas when we talk about wheat, milk, soy, or egg, 80% of people will outgrow this allergy. And so, um, you know, the landscape is changing. I'm gonna talk a little bit about it more in the next slide, but <clears throat> as an allergist now, when it comes to milk and egg and wheat and soy, we are very, um, we try really hard to follow regularly to see if patients have outgrown it trying to incorporate in the diet, and then ultimately see if we can fully outgrow it. And then um, seafood is a very common allergy that actually can begin later in life. So I have actually many patients, if I have an adult usually come in for an allergy, a food allergy, uh, you know, oftentimes it will be seafood, but it can be anything. These are just the top nine. Okay, so let me move on to testing. So testing, uh, you know, the history is very important. Timing of reaction is a really big part of what I kind of figure out as far as it, should I be testing in the first place? Um, the symptoms that occurred, 
Was it a new food that you've tried? And ultimately, a lot of people come in kind of trying to get testing before they've ever had the food. And so I really try to find out, have you ever eaten this before and how has it been? There are lots of over-the-counter tests available now that test again what's called IgE, IgG, sorry. And so this is just not a reliable measure of what we will occur, what will occur clinically. So this testing occurs. I mean, this testing exists and people can buy it. Um, I won't go into names of what that testing is, but ultimately you can get a test, you can get results, but what does that mean? Is it providing you any information that makes any sense? And right now I would say that no, it doesn't, okay? We do um, this same type of testing I described for environmental allergies. So the first round, which is called skin prick testing we do for foods, we don't do interdermal testing for foods because there is a chance of anaphylaxis at the higher concentration. And like I've said, or kind of have hinted at, uh, skin testing should be judicious. We should really be testing foods that are of concern and nothing more. Unless the history is very broad and someone went and ate a food that had shellfish and peanuts and sesame, I try really hard not to test a panel of foods. And really there's almost no indication to, to do a panel testing of foods, okay? There are a few reasons why I say this. The main reason is that uh, skin testing is useful in its own way, but there are, you know, it's not perfect. This is the test we have right now, but it's just not perfect. And so when I look at skin testing, a negative skin test is very useful, okay? The chance that a negative skin test is wrong is extremely low, meaning that if it's negative, I can say with confidence at 99%, so it has a 99% for negative predictive value, that I can trust this test. And I can say, you know, I think realistically you are not allergic to this food. So that's really helpful for me. So when I see that almost, it's, you know, like a breath of fresh air. A positive skin test is not that great. So the same test, but a positive skin test relates back to positive predictive value. So if someone has a positive skin test, it only correlates back accurately to real life, like a real clinical reaction about 50% of the time. So that means that it's equivalent to a flip of a coin. So this means without a history of eating that food causing an issue, I may test you and have a whole list of false positives and that can lead to unnecessary removal of foods from a diet. And from my standpoint, I just can't really recommend that for people. And so the best way, the last thing I'll talk about is um, how can I as an allergist help someone who's like nervous or feels like there could be a potential reaction? The best way to see if a food causes a reaction is actually to try it. It's called a food challenge. And so graded food challenges is are what are off it, offered at uh, allergy offices. And when a patient is trying to, um, basically what you're doing is you're trying a serving size of the food. So for nuts, it's two tablespoons in a graded manner with close observation, okay? So we give a little bit, we watch you, we take vitals, we examine you, we go on to the next step, okay? And there are different cutoffs for different foods. So your skin test or blood test doesn't have to be fully negative to do this. But basically if we're seeing trends and we're seeing that, um, you know, we're in the range where we can offer this, we will. This last picture actually is called fresh brick on prick. This is related back to how we test for food specifically, uh, you know, at our office, we have all the different allergens for environmental allergies. We have a whole list of foods that we have kind of on hand. But when it comes to fruits and vegetables and the ability to test, the best way to test is actually bringing that fruit or vegetable in. So this patient um, had some, you know, some foods that they were allergic to. So they brought it into the office and we made skin, skin testing from it. So these little individual testing are uh, called quintips. And that's when you do single testing. All right, so management, um, current management, if you're allergic to the food involves avoiding the food. Um, you know, it's, it's hard, but if you are allergic, that is our recommendation currently. The only medication that's out there right now to save your life is called epinephrine, okay? There's nothing else out there that can mitigate a severe reaction. So I'm gonna say that again, the only medication out there that's life-saving is epinephrine. So if someone has an IgE-mediated allergy and I feel strong that it's an IgE-mediated allergy, they need to carry that medicine with them at all times. So Benadryl won't cut it, Zyrtec won't cut it, which we do talk about using in certain instances, but it has to be an EpiPen or AbbVQ or you know, another epinephrine auto-injector. This is because a term called natural history of an allergic reaction, how you will react the next time you eat it is very unpredictable. So you could have had hives on your face one time and the next time end up in the hospital. And I don't know. And right now we have no idea 
um, who's going to be that person. And so from our standpoint, we're pretty strict about that. And then the other thing is that when we do testing, size of the testing doesn't correlate with severity of reaction. So what we do as allergists is, you know, when we're talking about offering those food challenges, we follow trends. We see if the values are going up specifically for an individual or if they're coming down. And then we use that information really very on an individual basis. There is good news. Um, like I said, the allergy food, the food allergy landscape is changing. When we talk about immunotherapy for um, you know, arrow allergens or environmental allergies, that's very kind of established. But there is oral immunotherapy in the works in general for foods as well. And so that is not getting a shot towards it, but there have been different ways that have been tried to be developed. There's been a patch in the past, but right now, you know, in 2022, there's something specific for peanuts that exists. It's called palforzia. You basically, the same concept, get a little bit by little bit, but you're not getting like one peanut. You're getting like one three hundredth of a peanut. We follow very carefully and we build up in dosing to help your body learn how to tolerate peanut protein. Now, from that standpoint, you are not cured of your peanut allergy. You still have to avoid it. You still would most likely carry an EpiPen. But the idea is that if you came in contact with it, we are trying to mitigate or prevent a severe reaction. So say you go to Baskin Robbins or an ice cream store and the person before you had Reese's peanut butter ice cream, you know, and by chance they didn't fully wash that ice cream scoop. This is a way to help prevent the chance of you having a severe reaction from those kind of settings. All right, I'm gonna give a plug about Halloween. So uh, it's our, it, you know, I love Halloween. It's coming up soon. It's the biggest treat holiday in America. Um, and in general, people who have food allergies are really vigilant about this holiday, but, you know, allergies can make their way into foods that we're not familiar with during the holiday season. So things that you might not even think of, which I didn't even know before, but candy corn can contain egg whites and sesame oil. Um, and sesame oil is something that sesame allergic patients have to avoid. These are two of the top common nine allergens and they're everywhere and oftentimes used for crafting and not just consumption. Mini or fun size candy can be, can be manufactured differently than their regular or bigger size version. So while you may feel like you can trust the bigger size version, we know less about the mini or fun size or you would probably have to contact that company. So checking before consumption is pretty important. Licorice contains wheat as a binding agent. And really for our patients who have allergies, if you cannot, if it doesn't contain, oh, sorry. if it has no, Apologies. If it has no label or you can't rule out the allergy, the best idea is to trade it or throw it away. It's unfortunate, but ultimately that's the best, the safest way to go about it. Okay. Non-food treats are a great way to include everybody. These include stickers, pencils, glow sticks, slinkies. You know, if you go to Target, there are vampire fangs or ghost tattoos. The list goes on. There are lots of different ways to include everyone. Okay. And um, a lot of stores actually have them in the Halloween section now but you can go to like, you know, party sections too, and they have them there. And FAIR is a is a uh, really big food allergy kind of consortium. It stands for food allergy uh, kind of, it's called, it's called FAIR, but it's foodallergy.org. And they have an initiative called the Teal Pumpkin Project. And it's an idea, it's an inclusive way to inform and educate people about food allergies during a time where candy is so prevalent. So there are really two ways you can be involved. So as a treat provider, you can have a teal pumpkin out on your porch to signify you have safe treats to offer. You can also add your house on a map nationally on the FAIR website. And as a treat recipient, you can carry a teal bucket letting people know that you have an allergy without saying it out loud. Now, we may not think of it, you know, but food allergies can be a huge source of anxiety for kids. It can cause shame and embarrassment in the kid population. And when they're little, this is a nice way to have, it, you know, kind of letting people know without having to verbalize it. So. My son has food allergies and um, we carry a tail pumpkin. You know, we carry the little, we carry the bucket and, you know, he doesn't know right now he's little, but you know, as time goes on, hopefully he understands and he can be better about advocating for himself too. Okay, food allergies is done. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you, Dr. Gobin. I think we are going a little bit over time and uh, um, our, uh, you know, the attendance, like uh, you will get a link to the YouTube link where you can see the full video. And really apologies for going over, but I think this has been an interesting topic and, and we have, you know, many questions. And uh, 
uh, we'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, Dr. Gobind, is that good? Is that okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Um, so the next question is, uh, um, see, you already answered, what kinds of food cause uh, rhinitis? Um, and then uh, any long-term consequences of untreated allergies, we went through that. Um, can you outgrow food and environmental allergies between childhood to adulthood? Do some allergies only develop in adulthood and can those be outgrown? Yeah, so allergies can develop at any time. Uh, there are big times in life where we see kind of a preponderance of allergies. One is around the age of five. That has to do more with how many seasons you've been alive for and allergies presenting. Thereafter, we see another big spike around puberty. Then after that, women have a few more times in life where you can have a change. So pregnancy, anytime you're pregnant can cause a change in allergies and being pregnant itself can lead to congestion. It's called rhinitis of pregnancy. Uh, menopause also can do it. And then as we get older in life, allergies tend to fade. So you can be really allergic as, in the, as a kid and become less allergic as an adult, but we do see it here and there all the time. Kind of an interesting phenomenon that occurred with COVID is that people started spending way more time at home, like way more time than they ever had in their life. And, you know, previously they would be out of the house for 40, 50, 60 hours a week, but then now you're spending pretty much every single hour, 24 seven at home. And we started seeing that people would ha were having allergies and they're like, I've never had allergies before I did. They weren't so horrible and I'm feeling awful now. And if you can imagine the one that they were noticing or having on testing that we saw was dust mite allergy. So, you know, your environment can also play a role. If you move somewhere that can play a role too. And uh, they want to know if, they if you test for parasites or is it only done if the patient asks for it? Testing for parasites is very specific in that, um, you know, we do have tests for parasites that exist. It's often collected through stool. Um, it is only done in a setting when we feel like it's necessary. So it's not something that's done on a regular basis, but we do have patients that come in for what's called eosinophilia, like a high preponderance of eosinophil cells, these allergy cells. If I see that, or I feel like that is something that doesn't really make sense in my patient, like they don't have allergies, they don't have any issues like that, we will go down that route of testing. And uh, so this is a tough one. So where is the best place to live if you have seasonal allergies? <laughs> um, I don't know. I think that everywhere you go has some level of allergies. Uh, if you have seasonal allergies specifically, probably uh, somewhere really, really, really cold where nothing can, everything's dead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough one, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, food allergy to peanuts uh, were, are so, uh, very prevalent in children. That mm -hmm. was not many years ago. Can, uh, can a child, uh, yeah, can a child receive shots to outgrow allergy? Yeah, we just talked about it a little bit. No shots per se. Um, oral immunotherapy exists. It's not to cure the allergy. It's to help prevent a severe reaction. It's actually peanut like powder specifically. So you mix it in with a food. So it exists right now. If you have someone that's peanut allergic in the age range of four to 17, they potentially could qualify for doing that treatment to help prevent a severe reaction, but no shots as of now. Okay. And uh, someone wants to know if uh, sesame oil and peanut oil, same as sesame and peanut by themselves. Yeah, so every oil except sesame is fine. If you have a peanut allergy, you can eat peanut oil. So for example, Chick-fil-A uses peanut oil and my son eats there all the time. He's allergic to peanuts. He's had no issues. Actually, we didn't even know that they use peanut oil. We learned later. So it was kind of a nice way of going about it, but you can feel confident that it's filtered enough that there is no peanut protein. For sesame, the allergen is, is very small and it's just impossible to filter it fully. So sesame oil is the only oil if you're sesame allergic that I tell people to avoid. But if you've eaten it before and you've had no issue, then we tell people to continue it. That's very interesting. Yeah. yeah. And the next question is, is it all right to put up with angioedema and not treat it with medicine, especially if there's nothing except being highly uncomfortable? Um, angioedema is a little hard. So angioedema, if people don't know what that means, it's swelling. Um, and so 
I would say that it's probably in your best interest, whoever this may be, to find out what's going on and why you have it. Only because angioedema can occur in places like your lip, okay, your ear, okay, your hand, okay, your throat, not okay, right? You're stuck now. You have swelling and you have this time frame, you know, it could be minutes, it could be seconds before you stop being able to breathe. And so that is actually the biggest concern and why people end up in the hospital when they have angioedema is because their airway closes. So I would say it's probably in your best interest to find out why or what's going on because it, it's uncomfortable now, but what if it's more? And there are certain medicines that can lead to it. And if you're on that medicine, we usually try to change you off of them. And um, um, can we prevent food allergies in kids watching what mom eats during pregnancy? Um, no, <laughs> not right now. I would say that that date, that is a huge topic right now, trying to figure out what can we do to help prevent so, uh, you know, I would say probably a decade ago, the thought was you don't eat allergenic food till about age two. And that has changed drastically in this past, you know, let's say six years, but because a lot of studies came out showing that people were having allergies at the age of two, because we weren't introducing in people's diet. So now we tell people to start early, meaning early, not like when they're one month old, but when you would start other foods. So starting allergenic foods and um, starting, uh, but at the same time, you start any other food. So you're doing banana, but you should also do peanut butter at the same time when your food, when your child is ready developmentally to eat. Okay. So that's a big change from, you know, probably like 10 years ago. And then what you can eat ultimately, um, I wish, you know, I think actually people feel very guilty that they did something that led to their child having allergies. So I'm here to actually say that there's not much you can do right now, you know, um, we're trying to find that stuff out. There's lots of research in it currently, and that may change as time goes on as to what we can offer or tell people. But, um, you know, I have patients say that I eat a peanut butter jelly sandwich every single day and my son's allergic to peanuts. So like from that standpoint, it's just so hard to know, you know? Uh, so I would say not right now, soon, I hope. Okay. And uh, this other question is, I know, I mean, now the summer is uh, almost over. I've, it's over, actually. And, uh, this question is about mosquito bites. Um, they have had nasty reaction to mosquito bites this summer. Um, so, like, uh, do you have any comments on that? Like, you know, why some people get, you know, very severe reaction to mosquito bites and some don't? Yeah, uh, unfortunately... There's not much we can do from a standpoint of testing. It's called Skeeter syndrome, actually. Uh, so from that aspect, uh, we talk about pretreatment with antihistamines and allergy meds to kind of help reduce the uh, you know chance of the reaction becoming very big. If the, if the reaction is big thereafter, sometimes people will need steroids or topical medicine like hydrocortisone. Uh, there's no like immunotherapy that exists specifically for mosquito bites. It just hasn't been shown to be beneficial. My next few slides, which I don't know if we're going to get to talk about other insects like bees and venom and, you know, like that kind of stuff, which because they can have fatal reactions, immunotherapy exists for those. But usually we talk about pre-treatment and then treating appropriately with antihistamines, which is probably your best, um, best defense with uh, mosquito bites. Yeah. I mean, this has been a, you know, very interesting topic. And then I think it's a popular one. I think we need to bring you again. Dr. Okay, all right, sounds good. Yes, uh, and uh, uh, one last question about uh, dermatographism. Like, you know, some kids, you know, when they scratch their skin, they get uh, dermatographism, uh, elevated skin uh, reaction. So mm -hmm. any comments, is it serious? Um, you know, how do we do testing for that? Yeah, if there's dermatographism for no specific reason other than when they scratch, they end up having what's called hives or dermatographic urticaria. Urticaria is a big word for hives. Uh, actually, no testing is necessary. That's a huge topic on its own, actually. Uh, hives and urticaria and, you know, up in that same category, angioedema would fall. We usually try to figure out if there's something that we can think of causing it. And if not, um, testing is actually usually not recommended. We just talk about medication and helping prevent it. Sounds good. And, uh, um, you know, I thank all of you, all the audience for being here. And uh, um, we are running out of time, actually. Um, it, you know, we have gone 15 minutes <laughs> time, but uh, uh, thank you uh, for your patience. And uh, I appreciate Dr. Gobin for being here. You had a busy clinic today. And after that, you came and spent this good, valuable time uh, educating our audience. Really appreciate it. Um, and, uh, 
Yeah, thank you. And uh, I would like to remind the audience that, you know, you have to reach out to your primary care provider. And, you know, if you have any questions regarding your allergies, then get a, you know, referral to see the allergy immunology specialist. And um, thank you so much. And uh, we're going to end the session today. Good night, everyone.